Welcome and thank you for taking part in the continuing legal education CLE course, Focus on Able Accounts, a financial tool specifically for people with disabilities. This CLE will provide an overview on how Able Accounts can positively impact people with disabilities, their families, and their caregivers. It will also provide statutory background on how ABLE accounts are administrated, including eligibility requirements, account management, contributions, spending ABLE funds for disability-related expenses, tax benefits, and interactions with benefits programs such as Medicaid and SSI. We additionally will provide practice pointers for the usage of ABLE accounts including working in conjunction with special needs trust. This first of its kind CLE course was developed by ABLE Today in partnership with the National Association of State Treasurers or NAST Foundation and the ABLE Savings Plans Network also known as ASPEN. ABLE Today is part of the NAST Foundation and together ASPEN and ABLE Today work to empower individuals with disabilities toward more independent and secure futures by offering tools and resources on the benefits of ABLE accounts. ABLE today was generously provided with support from Wells Fargo and is aligned with their philanthropic mission to improve the financial health of low and moderate income Americans through evidence-based planning and education and innovative financial services. Our presenters include program leaders from across the ABLE industry and are members of the ABLE Savings Plan Network. They include Chuck Saya, who is both the co-administrator of the NH ABLE Plan and the executive director of the New Hampshire Governor's Commission on Disability. Elisa Ferguson, who is the program manager for ABLE Now and the associate general counsel at Virginia 529. John Stevens, who is the director of the Pennsylvania Treasury Bureau of Savings Programs the legal advisor for ABLE Today, Juliana Christ, and I am Eric Achmanik, and I serve as the program director for ABLE Today. ABLE accounts are a profoundly impactful financial tool for people with disabilities, their families, and their caregivers. ABLE accounts are savings and spending tools built specifically for people with disabilities that allow individuals to save money while helping them protect their eligibility for means-tested benefits programs such as Medicaid and SSI. They allow people with disabilities to spend money to improve their health, independence, and quality of life, while also having the choice to save for long-term expenses in their future. Similar to Special Needs Trust, ABLE accounts offer benefits protections, but with more independence and ease, like a checking account. ABLE accounts are a game changer for people with disabilities their families and their caregivers towards greater opportunities for financial independence and community inclusion. Some of the primary benefits of ABLE accounts include, ABLE accounts allow people with disabilities to save money in addition to asset limitations set by means-tested benefits programs such as Medicaid or SSI. Asset limits can prevent people with disabilities from saving money beyond $2,000, which is a typical asset limit. Monies within an ABLE account can earn interest and the interest grows tax-free. Special needs trusts are a well-known financial option. ABLE accounts can be an additional tool and can serve as a complement for special needs trusts. ABLE accounts can be added to the list of disbursements for special needs trusts and can expand the purchasing power for people with disabilities. You all probably know someone who's had to spend down their assets to remain eligible for means-tested benefits programs. ABLE accounts can help people avoid spend down and save those funds instead. And through an ABLE account, people with disabilities can gain more financial independence by altering their financial planning from month to month to year to year. The ABLE Act was passed as the Stephen Beck Jr. Achieving a Better Life Experience Act and signed into law in 2014. The IRS is the only federal agency with oversight authority for ABLE accounts. The IRS has published regulations that govern ABLE accounts. We'll go over many of those rules in this presentation. We wanna provide a snapshot of the national overview of ABLE account numbers. 
the first ABLE programs launched in the summer of 2016, and all of them are administrated by state agencies, including state treasury offices, college 529 agencies, and developmental disability councils. There are 46 states in the District of Columbia offering ABLE programs, many of which are available for enrollment by out-of-state residents. There are 49 total ABLE programs offered today in the United States, as two states are offering two ABLE program options. For context behind ABLE nationwide numbers, as of September 2023, there are more than 158,000 ABLE accounts across all programs, and national enrollments are increasing every day. There's also over $1.55 billion in nationwide ABLE accounts. You can always find updated and historic ABLE data at abletoday.org slash national dash ABLE dash data. And now I'd like to introduce you to our next presenter, Chuck Saya from New Hampshire. My name is Chuck Saya, and I am the co-administrator of the New Hampshire ABLE Plan, and I am also the executive director of the New Hampshire Governor's Commission on Disability. Before we go too much further, it's important to understand just who is eligible to open an ABLE account. As co-administrator of New Hampshire's ABLE program, along with the New Hampshire State Treasurer since 2017, I can tell you that it is a game changer for many when they understand eligibility. To open an ABLE account, you must have a physical or mental disability that began before age 26. The phrase you will hear most often is onset of disability was before age 26. However, that does not mean that the ABLE account must be opened before age 26. Individuals can enroll in an ABLE account at any age as long as their disability onset was before age 26. So for example, if an individual were to open an account at age 35, so long as that person can certify that the onset of disability was before age 26, that person is eligible for an ABLE account. In addition, there's a monumental change on the horizon beginning January 1st, 2026. New federal legislation called the ABLE Age Adjustment Act will increase this onset age from 26 to 46, making an estimated 6 million more people eligible for ABLE accounts. This is something especially veterans groups have sought for a long time. For example, if an individual has been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, or perhaps an individual has a mental health disability, should that disability have occurred after age 26, but prior to age 46, under the ABLE Age Adjustment Act, that person is now eligible for an ABLE account. It's obvious the word disability is central to eligibility. Depending on how it is used, this is a word that may carry many meanings. So what counts as proof of disability here? While an enrollee only needs to meet one of the following, here are several ways. Have a written diagnosis from a doctor. Note that for ABLE purposes, the diagnosing physician must be a type of medical doctor. A diagnosis from a psychologist or clinical therapist will not be sufficient. You already receive supplemental security income, also known as SSI, due to your disability. You are entitled to SSI, but your benefits have been suspended solely due to excess income or resources. You already receive SSDI, and lastly, you have a condition on the Social Security Administration's list of compassionate allowances conditions. When we look at what counts as proof of disability, it is the ABLE programs across the country are geared toward ease in enrolling. You will certify to criteria as a proof of disability. Before we close out the topic of eligibility, there are three additional 
eligibility rules that deserve mention here. You may have only one ABLE account at a time, and this is standard for all ABLE programs across the country. Generally, eligibility follows the Social Security Administration's marked and severe functional limitations criteria. However, age or working status does not affect this. This means that you can have substantial gainful activity and still be eligible for an ABLE account. And lastly, and of particular interest, receipt of benefits is not required for ABLE eligibility. It is just one avenue to eligibility. Now, when it's time to open an account, start by setting out about 15 minutes. I have been told by any number of enrollees that the process of enrollment is quick and easy and only takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Understandably though, this does require a little bit of preparation and homework to research various programs and choices as well. At the launch of the New Hampshire program in 2017, I was told by a mother of an individual with a disability that it took her, on behalf of her child, to open the ABLE account about 12 minutes. Most ABLE programs have an online enrollment which walks you through the steps and research about a state's ABLE program is readily available. Keep in mind that the vast majority of ABLE accounts are not bank accounts. So in this instance, you are not going to see the traditional brick and mortar buildings where to open an account. You would not go to a bank to open an ABLE account. Currently, the only exception is the ABLE program for the state of Maine, which is a checking account offered through a local bank. Maine's program, however, is only available to Maine residents. You can find the list of ABLE programs at abletoday.org. You will discover that research on state ABLE programs has been conveniently collected in one place. States are listed and linked. For example, click on New Hampshire, if I may use this, and you are immediately provided the enrollment site, information about the administrators, and ability to go right to the program site. Go a step further in the Analyze ABLE Program section of abletoday.org, where you can easily check out a state's fees and other program basics in a user-friendly thumbnail style. Keep in mind that a few states, such as Florida, Maine, and Texas have a residency requirement. You must, for example, be a Florida resident in order to enroll in Florida's ABLE program. Now, what are the features of an ABLE account? Keep in mind that these may vary somewhat dependent upon the state's ABLE program. All in all, easy does it. As mentioned, most are opened online, although most programs also offer a paper application if you prefer. Account management is also handled online. There are many choices and typically about five to seven investment options, including stocks and bonds, plus FDIC insured cash options. There are minimal fees. Fees are approximately $35 a year plus potential investment fees, and truly convenient. Depending upon the program, you may also request a debit card, a loadable prepaid card, or a checkbook. Convenience is built into the programs as to how to spend your ABLE funds. New Hampshire, for example, has seven different options. There is one option, which is FDIC insured, uh, which is a checking account, offered by Fifth Third Bank, and there are six other target risk options. New Hampshire, as of late, also now has the checkbook feature. 
this is a great resource for parents of individuals with a dis disability should they like to purchase a something within the qualified disability expense, which we will hear um, in a little bit uh, during this slide deck. And it may just be easier for the parent to actually write a check and present it to the individual who may be selling something person to person as opposed to as a distributor or a manufacturer. If, it, if the mother would like to buy a power chair from another mother, it is easier to cut a check. ABLE account ownership is an important feature unique to ABLE accounts. The person with the disability owns the account and is known as the beneficiary. When New Hampshire launched its program in 2017, the term beneficiary didn't have the traditional or conventional meaning as it does within ABLE accounts. For ABLE purposes, the beneficiary of the ABLE account is the owner of the account. For an account owner with legal capacity, there are two ways for that person to manage the account. ABLE accounts may be self-administered if the account owner is able to open and manage the account on their own, or if the account owner is able to manage their own account but prefers not to, they can appoint anyone they choose to manage the account for them. And this could be true where an individual opens an account as the beneficiary and that person could assign a parent also to have the ability to manage the account for them. What if an account owner is a minor or is otherwise not able to manage their own account? Federal regulations allow the appointment of an authorized signatory. In order of priority, an authorized signatory can be a power of attorney, a POA, a conservator, a guardian, a spouse, a parent, a sibling, a grandparent, or a Social Security Administrative, Administration representative payee. The list of authorized signatories has been expanded since the ori original federal legislation of 2014. The addition of the SSA representative payee, as you can imagine, was a welcome change. And I can testify and, and state on behalf of ABLE programs when New Hampshire had its launch in 2017, the Social Security Administration representative payee was not an option. However, as we all know, because the rep payee has for years has had an in integral part of assisting an individual with a disability manage their finances, the addition of the rep payee has been a welcome um, to the list. As noted though, this is a prioritized list. That means that in order to open an account as someone's authorized signatory, you will have to certify that there is no other person who ranks higher than you on this list who is also willing and able to manage the account for the benefit of the beneficiary. And while the beneficiary is always the legal owner of the funds, because ABLE is a first party vehicle, programs may differ. Some programs allow more than one authorized signatory or require documented proof of the relationship to the beneficiary. You may, for example, have to upload a copy of a birth certificate, a rep payee letter, or guardianship papers in order to open the account. The authorized signatory can be an individual or an entity. Particular attention should be paid to an entity as the authorized signatory. If the state has an office, such as the Office of Public Guardian, which deals with wards, this is a powerful resource for asset management. And with that, I'd like to introduce to you my colleague, Elisa Ferguson from the Virginia ABLE Plan, who will go over transactions, spending, and tax rules. And with that, Elisa, I turn it over to you. My name is Elisa Ferguson and I am the program manager for ABLE Now, and I also serve as Associate General Counsel for Virginia 529. Now that an ABLE account is open for an eligible individual, the next step is to fund it. Remember, anyone can, can contribute to an ABLE account. That includes the beneficiary, family, friends, 
organizations, nonprofits, employers, etc. So there's a very long list. The most common way to can contribute to an ABLE account are transferring money from another source, like a bank. This can be one-time or reoccurring payments. Accounts or special needs trusts. Another way is depositing funds, like a check, maybe from your personal bank account, setting up a payroll deposit or direct deposit from the SSA for benefits. Again, these two could be recurring. Some programs feature gifting platforms that make it easy for friends and family to contribute to an ABLE account. This is a popular way for people to assist their loved ones and friends. Another great way to fund an ABLE account is with a rollover from a 529 savings account. If you have money saved in a 529 account, then you can transfer those funds to an ABLE account, subject to certain rules that will be discussed later in this presentation, without incurring taxes or penalties. Please note that ABLE accounts can only hold cash contributions. You cannot deposit other property or assets into an ABLE account. How much money you can contribute annually to an ABLE account is based on two factors. The first is the standard ABLE account annual contribution limit, which is 18,000 for 2024. And it's tied to the annual gift tax exclusion amount that is set by the IRS and adjusted periodically for inflation. The other factor is if an employed ABLE beneficiary could contribute over the annual contribution limit, and this is only if they have earned income and neither they nor their employer made contributions on their behalf to an employer-sponsored retirement plan during that year. These extra contributions do have a limit though. They are limited to the lesser of the amount of the beneficiary's compensation income or the prior year's federal poverty guideline for a one-person household in the beneficiary's state of residence. And for 2024, that number is $14,580, but it could be higher for Alaska and Hawaii residents. Note that there is also a maximum account balance set by individual states. The balance limit is generally tied to their state's 529 college savings program aggregate account limit. So always check with the ABLE program state. For most states, this maximum account balance limit is at or above $500,000, but some are higher or lower. Once an ABLE account reaches that maximum balance limit, Contributions will be suspended or not accepted until the account's balance dips back below the maximum account balance limit. At that point, contributions can resume. Even though you are temporarily prevented from depositing more money into the account after you reach the maximum account balance limit, your investments can still continue to grow in your ABLE account. There are a variety of options available across programs, but the goal is to make ABLE programs easy to use and easy to get your money out. Again, most programs feature online account management and payment directions. Some of the most common options to withdraw money are, first, personal checks. Some programs provide personal checkbooks for easy payments to third parties. Another way is a debit card. Many programs feature debit cards or prepaid cards that allow you to make purchases or withdraw cash at an ATM. The programs that offer debit cards allow you to pull account funds directly from a cash investment inside the ABLE account. Other programs have loadable prepaid cards. To use the prepaid card, you transfer money from the ABLE account and load it directly onto the prepaid card. Some ABLE prepaid cards allow you to customize features to meet your very specific spending needs. For instance, you can set restrictions so that the debit card will only work at certain stores. 
so that it will only allow cash withdrawals or so that it will decline purchases over a certain amount of money. So these can be great tools and features for certain individuals. Another way you can get money out of your account is a check by the program. Some programs allow you to request payment to a third party and the program issues the check from your ABLE account. This is similar to a standard bill pay request. The last way that you can make withdrawals from some programs is electronic bank transfer. Many programs allow you to use the ABLE account to transfer funds to a personal bank account. This is a simple online request to a program's online management portal and is often used to set up a reoccurring payment. Now on to spending your funds. ABLE funds must be used for qualified disability expenses. The Internal Revenue Code and the federal regulations for ABLE programs define what counts as a qualified disability expense, sometimes referred to as QDEs. When determining if an expense is a QDE, ask two questions. Does the expense relate to the individual, the account beneficiary's disability? And if so, does it help maintain or improve the beneficiary's health, independence, or quality of life? If your answer to both questions is yes, then the expense qualifies as a QDE. Now the definition of QDEs is intentionally broad and expansive, and the IRS and Treasury actually declined to give a comprehensive list or a list of expenses that do not meet the standard. So whether something is or is not a QDE depends on each eligible individual's unique circumstances. So to elaborate, here's some examples of qualified disability expenses. Again, in the federal regulations for ABLE programs, the IRS provides several examples of QDE categories, and those are shown here on this slide. Now remember, this list is not exhaustive. So it includes, but is not limited to, expenses related to housing, transportation, health and wellness, assistive technology, education, food and grocery items, financial management, legal services, employment training and support, personal support services, and funeral expenses. So bottom line, just think of any basic living expenses. So it really helps to give some real life examples of how actual ABLE beneficiaries are using the funds from their ABLE accounts. People have used ABLE accounts to pay for items like food for a service dog, eating out at a restaurant or any other special event. Maybe they need a smartphone and a plan for that smartphone. The purchase of a video game for exercise could qualify and payment of Special Olympics dues. Also music therapy or really any special therapy for a beneficiary would qualify. So these are often therapies that individuals benefit from or other costs that would not be covered by insurance but are considered qualified disability expenses. It's important to note, and there is guidance from the IRS on QDEs. They stated that a QDE is not limited to medically necessary items or costs, and a QDE does not need to solely benefit just the beneficiary. So an example that I have heard of is that if an ABLE beneficiary wants or needs to travel to participate in an event like Special Olympics, and that individual, the beneficiary, requires a travel companion or guardian to safely navigate the trip, then the ABLE account could be used to fund the guardian or travel companion's cost of travel. So those travel expenses are not solely for the ABLE beneficiary, but still relates to the beneficiary's disability and it improves the beneficiary's health, independence, and quality of life. So on to tax benefits. ABLE accounts are tax advantage vehicles. So remember that the money in the ABLE account grows tax-free, and that includes investments and earnings. 
When you take the money out of the ABLE account, the withdrawal is also tax-free if used for a QDE that we just talked about. Remember that a beneficiary may be eligible for the federal savers credit for an ABLE contribution as well. This credit is designed to help low and moderate income taxpayers and could apply up to $2,000 in ABLE contributions. The taxpayer must meet eligibility requirements, including being at least 18 years of age, not being dependent or full-time student, and there are some adjusted gross income requirements. Check with the ABLE program because many states offer tax credits or deductions for ABLE contributions. These may be limited to that state's taxpayers participating in their state's ABLE program. For example, in order to get the Virginia state ABLE tax deduction, you have to be enrolled in one of Virginia's ABLE plans. Note that the ABLE beneficiary may receive a few tax forms. 1099 QA form for withdrawals and 5498 QA form for contributions. A beneficiary should keep those forms for their tax records and may need them to take advantage of any state income tax credits or deductions. Any contributions to an ABLE account made by a third party are considered completed gifts to the ABLE beneficiary. When contributing to an ABLE account, the contributor should keep this in mind since contributions would count towards an annual gift, gifting amount. Note that if an employer contributes to the employee's ABLE account, the total amount contributed by the employer is also treated as income to the employee and is taxed as such. Now to consider non-qualified purchases, there is no requirement to report ABLE account withdrawals on an income tax return unless the funds are used for non-qualified expenses, so anything that is not a QDE. If a withdrawal is non-qualified, then the ABLE beneficiary must pay income tax on the earnings portion of the account as well as a 10% penalty on the earnings portion. We have an example to illustrate how this works, shown here. In the example, Julio takes $100 from his ABLE account and 90% of that amount is principal with 10% representing earnings, so $10 of earnings. Then Julio uses the $100 for a non-qualified purchase, so an expense that is not a qualified disability expense. For tax purpose, Julio must claim the $10 as income on his tax in income tax return. He will also have to pay his regular income tax rate on those earnings, plus an additional 10% penalty on the $10 of earnings. Note that if a benefits agency is aware of this non-qualified expense, they may also count a non-qualified withdrawal from an ABLE account as a resource for the ABLE beneficiary's means-tested benefits. This may have an impact on the amount of means-tested benefits received by that individual, such as SSI. Next up, John Stevens from Pennsylvania ABLE will go over public benefits rules and end-of-life considerations. John. Thanks very much, Elisa. My name is John Stevens. I'm the director of the Pennsylvania ABLE Savings Program. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the interplay between ABLE and federal programs today, including SSI and Medicaid. So why don't we jump right in? So how do ABLE accounts interact with federal and state benefits? Generally, all federal means-tested benefits have to disregard funds in an ABLE account, as well as any qualified expenses taken from that ABLE account. And as, as we've already discussed, what's considered qualified is really expansive. I can't emphasize enough that this applies not only to disability-related programs, but also benefits like the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, as well as programs offered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. So you may be asking yourself, what happens if an account owner takes a non-qualified withdrawal? In that case, the funds that were withdrawn are probably not protected and will be considered accountable asset. That said, since ABLE programs don't ask account owners whether a withdrawal is qualified or non-qualified, they don't and in fact can't report that information to federal agencies like the SSA or the IRS. Now, federal agencies may ask account owners about the nature of a withdrawal, but the good news is that the SSA is essentially obligated to take the word of an account owner about whether an expense is qualified or not. The agency's Program Operations Manual System, or POMS, states that it must obtain and accept the individual's allegation that he or she used or intends to use the distribution for a qualified or non-qualified expense. So how do states handle ABLE accounts? 
Many states treat ABLE accounts in the same way that federal programs do. However, your state may have important distinctions, so you make sure that you review your state's laws. You'll want to look for language that says ABLE account balances are disregarded for purposes of state and local benefit programs. For example, Pennsylvania law specifically excludes PA ABLE account funds from being included in calculations to determine the eligibility for disability, medical assistance, or other health benefits conferred by the Commonwealth. Note the distinction between federal law and Pennsylvania law. While virtually all federal means-tested benefits exclude ABLE account funds, Pennsylvania protections include a more limited set of programs. Now, it's important to remember that ABLE is an asset shield, not an income shield. So any income that an ABLE account owner deposits into their account is still countable income. You can't, for example, avoid income counting rules by having your paycheck direct deposited into an ABLE account. However, income from interest earned on the funds in an ABLE account is not countable. For example, if you deposit $1,000 into your ABLE account and earn $100 due to market performance or interest, that $100 will not count as income for benefits purposes, and it won't be taxable either. If that money was sitting in any other kind of individual account, you would not receive those advantages. Your earnings would be countable income, and they'd be taxed. Likewise, qualified withdrawals from an ABLE account are not countable income. A wrinkle in this rule is that neither qualified nor non-qualified withdrawals are countable income for the purposes of SSI and only for SSI. SSI only cares about qualified versus non-qualified withdrawals for counting assets, not for counting income. For those interested in guidance from a specific federal agency, here's a list of resources. Again, just to reiterate, reiterate a point I made earlier, as this list shows, ABLE assets are excluded from far more than disability-related programs. If you ever run into a situation where a regional office or benefits agency is wrongfully counting ABLE monies, you should point them to these resources. ABLE programs have had a lot of success doing so in the past. For example, several years ago we were hearing uh, reports that some HUD offices were incorrectly informing individuals that ABLE account funds were countable assets. We were able to use some of this guidance to help HUD clarify the matter with its regional offices. Uh, now, there's one citation that I want to call special attention to. The second POMS reference here on this slide is relatively new and provides some new rules for how representative payees can use ABLE accounts. Here are a couple of highlights. First, yes, ABLE accounts can be used to hold SSI funds, and yes, rep payees can deposit SSA benefits into an ABLE account with one significant caveat. The rep payee has to be named as the authorized signatory of the ABLE account. So if you have a situation where, for example, the account owner's mother is the authorized signatory, but a living facility where the account owner resides happens to be the rep payee, unfortunately, SSA funds cannot be deposited into that ABLE account. So we know the general rule of how federal programs treat ABLE funds, but there are some important SSI-specific distinctions that we need to keep in mind. First, only the first $100,000 in an ABLE account is disregarded for SSI purposes. Remember that this is, includes accrued interest as well as additional contributions. This is important to keep in mind when you consider third-party contributions. An ABLE account owner's balance may exceed $100,000 without their knowledge. But what happens if the ABLE account's balance goes so high that it exceeds the SSI resource limit? In that case, the account owner's SSI will be suspended but not terminated. There's no time limit on this suspension, so once the balance drops below the SSI threshold, SSI benefits can resume, whether it takes a month or it takes a year. Another critical point to keep in mind is that even if SSI is suspended in this way, it will not affect Medicaid, even in states where Medicaid eligibility is tied to SSI eligibility. An ABLE accounts balance will never affect Medicaid. Now here's a simple uh, example of how this works. If Jane has a balance of $100,250 in her ABLE account, $250 will count as a resource, regardless of whether that $250 is earned interest or a contribution. So now let's change the facts a little bit. Let's say Jane's balance increases to $105,000. That's over the SSI resource limit, and her SSI will be suspended. Next month, let's say Jane spends $5,000 of that $105,000 balance on some adaptive equipment. That would bring her ABLE account balance back down below the resource limit, and she'll be back on SSI. The second SSI-specific rule is that withdrawals for housing expenses or non-qualified expenses will count as a resource 
unless they are spent in the same month they're received. Let me say that again. The second SSI specific rule is that withdrawals for housing expenses or non-qualified expenses will count as a resource unless they are spent in the same month they're received. What counts as a housing expense? It's not just rent or mortgage. It also includes things like utilities, insurance, property tax, and even garbage removal. Let's uh, use an, an example to kind of illustrate this point. Let's say Jane withdraws $1,000 on May 15th. She deposits that money into her bank account and holds on to it until June 5th. She withdraws it at that point to pay her June rent. For SSI purposes only, for SSI purposes only, that $1,000 is a countable resource in June because Jane held the money beyond the end of the month in which she received it. Conversely, using the same hypothetical, let's say Jane uses the $1,000 that she withdrew on May 15th to pay her rent on May 20th. Since Jane spent the money in the same month in which she withdrew it, it's not a countable resource. Remember, this only applies to, applies to housing expenses. If Jane were to hold on to the $1,000 until June and then use it to pay for a computer or health-related equipment, the SSA would not count that money as a resource. So what happens in the unfortunate event uh, of the account owner's death? There are two possibilities. First, in some states, the account owner can name a successor owner who will take ownership of the account in the event of the original account owner's passing. Not all states allow for this, and some states require that the successor account owner be a sibling of the original account owner. So it's critical to check specific plan rules. Second, if there is no successor owner or an ABLE plan does not allow for one, the funds can be transferred to the account owner's estate. Before either of these options can be exercised, however, Medicaid payment must be addressed, maybe. So how does Medicaid payback apply to ABLE? While ABLE accounts are treated like any other first party vehicle, Medicaid payback applies in a far more limited way. Before Medicaid can make a claim, an ABLE account owner's executor can pay for any outstanding qualified expense. And remember, this includes funeral and burial expenses. Additionally, Medicaid can only request repayment for funds that were spent after the ABLE account was opened. And finally, Medicaid buy-in premiums that the account owner paid can be deducted from the amount that Medicaid can claim. Now, remember when I said that Medicaid payback applies maybe? Well, here's the maybe. These states restrict Medicaid payback, in some cases, prohibit it altogether. The level of restriction varies from state to state, so please review your state's law to determine how Medicaid payback is treated. Make sure to note the specifics. For instance, does payback protection only apply to those enrolled in your state's ABLE plan? How does your state's law treat Medicaid recovery from the account owner's estate as opposed to the ABLE account itself? By way of example, Pennsylvania law specifically prohibits the Department of Human Services from seeking payback from Pennsylvania ABLE accounts only. If your money is in another state's ABLE account, this does not apply. Other states' ABLE accounts are fair game. And even for PA ABLE account owners, once the assets transfer to the estate, human services may seek recovery. We know that Medicaid payback is a tricky subject, but don't let it scare you off. In many cases, Medicaid payback doesn't even apply to individuals until after age 55. So an account owner could be using an ABLE account for the first 55 years of their life before Medicaid payback even becomes a factor. That's plenty of time to accrue money in an ABLE account and spend down an even higher balance. Next up, Juliana Christ is going to talk about some practice pointers. Juliana, over to you. Thanks very much, John. Hi, everybody. My name is Juliana Christ. I'm a legal advisor and consultant for ABLE today. To wrap up our discussion, I'm going to offer some practice pointers. The goal here is to give you real life examples that you can go ahead and bring into your practice and use as you advise your clients. So first up, let's talk about ABLE accounts and special needs trusts. This is really one of the main areas we get questions on in the ABLE industry. People ask all the time, how does an ABLE account compare to a trust? Which one should I get? What if I already have a trust? Can I still get an ABLE account? First, uh, let me say, yes, you can have both a trust and an ABLE account. Many people do. I think that's a great way to plan. These tools are really complementary. They aren't necessarily in, in competition with each other, but maybe you only need one, or maybe your client has limited resources. Which one makes the most sense for your client? 
Let's just go over some of the main comparison points. First is cost. There is a big difference here. An ABLE account costs much less than a trust, both in terms of setup costs and ongoing maintenance fees. You also don't need a lawyer to set up an ABLE account or maintain it for you. So there's money savings there. And generally, it's going to be much quicker to get going. A second major difference is the level of control that the individual with a disability has. ABLE accounts offer a lot more freedom, more independence, uh, more easy access to funds. In contrast with a trust, the individual with a disability can't really touch the funds. They can't just wake up one day, sort of realize they need a new smartphone and say, all right, let me go get online, I'll order one for myself, or even, hey, let me grab my debit card, I wanna go eat uh, tonight with my friends. That kind of daily access and use isn't typically available with a trust, but with an ABLE account, it is. The truth is trust can be really helpful for folks with diminished capacity or folks who do need a lot of oversight. But for a lot of people with disabilities, the barriers that come with the trust honestly can be sometimes a little too heavy handed. I, I think of ABLE accounts as being able to serve more of a spectrum of people. ABLE works for people who are able to and want to manage their own money and it works for children or adults who are not able to manage their own money, or even for people who are maybe somewhere in between, right? People who are just learning financial management, people who might need some supportive decision-making. ABLE can really serve that whole spectrum. These accounts are, are just more customizable to the different levels of oversight that different people need. A couple of other ABLE advantages I wanna point out Beneficiaries can contribute to their own ABLE account. ABLE accounts can be used for shelter. Trusts generally cannot without affecting someone's benefits. And ABLE accounts, unlike some trusts, are not subject to the sole benefit or primary benefit spending rules. Actually, one other advantage that's not mentioned on this slide but is worth noting is that you don't have to file a separate tax return for an ABLE account like you do with many trusts. So that's another way that annual administration is just a little simpler on the ABLE side. Now, all that said, there are a couple of ways ABLE accounts are more restrictive than trusts. And both of these have already been covered by previous speakers, but just to note, ABLE accounts do have annual contribution limits, trusts do not. And ABLE accounts are subject to limited, limited Medicaid payback but with trusts, only some types are subject to Medicaid payback. Now this slide obviously is not a comprehensive comparison of ABLE and trusts, but hopefully it gives you at least a basic sense of some of the main differences between those two tools. So those are the differences, but the fact that ABLE accounts and trusts do have different features means that they can actually complement each other really, really well. Each tool can fill a gap that the other has. So I said at the outset that this doesn't have to be an either or situation. I'd really encourage all the practitioners out there to think about how you can use ABLE accounts and trusts together. Even if your client already has a trust, there could be a lot of good reasons to add on an ABLE account, honestly, even years later. And let me give you a couple reasons why. First, an ABLE account can help you overcome some of the main restrictions that are inherent in a trust. One big one that I'm sure you're aware of is that money in a trust generally cannot be used to purchase shelter without triggering a reduction in SSI or other benefits. But ABLE accounts, on the other hand, can be used for any kind of basic living expense, including shelter, without impacting benefits levels. So a very simple technique you can use in your practice is to distribute money from your client's trust into your client's ABLE account. And now those trust funds can be used for shelter. Uh, most attorneys that I have talked with do consider it good practice to go ahead and put an ABLE provision into the primary trust document. And I definitely agree this is good practice, although it's not strictly necessary uh, but if we flip to the next slide, we have some sample trust to ABLE distribution language for you. 
The particular paragraph we're showing here on this slide comes from training materials put together by the Academy of Special Needs Planners. A big thank you to them. And as you can see, the distribution language can be pretty short and sweet. It doesn't have to be complicated. Really, we're just trying to acknowledge uh, first the fact that the trustee is allowed to move trust money into an ABLE account. Second, that the cadence of those distributions can vary. So for example, it could be one distribution a year or multiple distributions a year, depending on what works best for you. And finally, we are trying to outline the things that the trustee should be taking into account before they go ahead with that ABLE transfer. Now, look, there's not only one right way to do this. Honestly, your trust language could vary depending on your state, your court, right, the nature of the trustee, et cetera. Um, for example, I've also seen trust language where the attorney will specifically say that the trustee has no obligation to oversee the ABLE spending or even ask about how the funds are ultimately spent from the ABLE account. So that can be a helpful limiting boundary for your trustee. The last practice pointer I wanna make about trust to ABLE distributions is this. Just remember that any distribution you make to the ABLE account is going to be subject to a ABLE's annual contribution limits, which remember for 2024, that limit is $18,000 a year. So the maximum trust distribution you could make to an ABLE account, at least in 2024, is $18,000. And that's only if no one else has made any other contributions to the ABLE account before the trust. So for instance, if let's say the beneficiary's parent has already contributed $10,000 to the beneficiary's ABLE account this year, that means your trust distribution is now limited to $8,000 in that same year. So we just re recommend checking with the ABLE beneficiary or their authorized signatory before you make a trust distribution, just to ensure that your distribution is within those annual contribution limits. This is the CLE code for this class. Please write the code down and retain it in your records. You will be asked to submit this code at the conclusion of the event to receive CLE credit and to complete the evaluation. The code is A is in alpha, C is in Charlie, 2, 8. A is in alpha, C is in Charlie, 2, 8. One last time, A, C, 2, 8. Again, please write this code down and retain it in your records. Thank you. Okay, enough about trust. Let's move on to a couple of other quick ways you can use ABLE accounts in your practice. First, uh, actually a relatively new development that we've recently started to hear about. As you know, we generally say an ABLE account can help you avoid asset counting rules, but not normal income counting rules. But there might be at least one exception to this, and it relates to child support. If you regularly practice in this area, you know that child support is generally considered income to the child. However, in at least one uh, Midwestern region, Social Security has said that if the child support payment is irrevocably assigned to the child's ABLE account by a judge, then the support payment actually is not considered income to the child. So that's definitely something to factor into your planning discussions with families and into child support hearings and determinations. Uh, lastly, on this point, just some food for thought. If you regularly interact with the regional or local SSA offices, you might consider asking perhaps for similar treatment for other types of payments that are irrevocably assigned. Uh, for instance, if a settlement award is irrevoc irrevocably assigned to a beneficiary's ABLE account perhaps it too could not count as income. Let me stress that this is just me posing a hypothetical at this point, so take that for what it is, but it could be an argument worth making. But for now, just know that the child support treatment is approved and currently happening in at least some SSA regions in practice. All right, so I just talked a little bit about settlements. Let's go ahead and dig in there um, just a little bit. How can ABLE accounts help with settlements? A large settlement award would otherwise be considered a resource to an individual with a disability, so good planning really necessitates shielding that settlement money somehow. And ABLE, honestly, is a great choice. 
if the settlement amount is less than $18,000, again, which is the 2024 annual contribution limit, then hey, you could put the full amount into the ABLE account and be done. If, though, the settlement amount is more than $18,000, you still have options. So let's imagine you have a $30,000 settlement award. You could put the first $18,000 into an ABLE account and the remaining 12 grand into a trust. Okay, that's one option. Another option, something else I've seen attorneys do, you could put the first $18,000 into ABLE and keep the remaining 12 grand in your client trust or IOLTA account until January 1st of the following calendar year. And at that point, the ABLE limits reset, right? So you can now put the last 12 grand into that same ABLE account. Now, caveat here, please check with your state's rules of professional conduct just to make sure that that practice conforms with your state's rules about IOLTA accounts and handling of client funds. Lastly, there is a third option to consider. Rather than agreeing to a lump sum payout for your settlement, you could actually arrange for a structured settlement annuity for your client. So have the defendant name your client's ABLE account as the annuity payee. Then yearly payments can be made to the ABLE account without running afoul of ABLE contribution limits or asset limits. So again, many ways to use an ABLE account to handle large awards. One last practice pointer before we finish up, college savings. What if you are working with a family that has been saving up for college, uh, maybe with a 529 account or an UTMA account, but as their child grows, maybe the family begins realizing, hey, you know what, college actually might not be the best choice for my kid. In fact, maybe my kid needs to get rid of some of this money quickly so that he or she can qualify for Medicaid. What should the family do with the money that's already been set aside? Easy answer, open an ABLE account for the child and you can roll the 529 money or the UPMA money into the ABLE account. Now, for an UPMA rollover, just keep in mind that there might be income or tax consequences associated with the transfer to the ABLE account. But 529 rollovers are really clean and easy. Federal law specifically allows for tax-free rollovers from a beneficiary's 529 account to the beneficiary's ABLE account. The only hitch is that 529 rollovers do count against the ABLE annual contribution limits. So depending on how much money you have right now in a 529 account, it might just take a few years before you have all of the funds rolled over to the ABLE account. And that is it. We really hope there are some good practical takeaways for you here that you can bring back to your everyday meetings and everyday practice. I will now go ahead and pass it back to our host, Eric Akmanik, um, from ABLE Today to close things out. Eric? Thank you, Juliana. To support you with more background on the positive impacts of ABLE accounts, you can go to our website at abletoday.org. Additionally, please reach out via team at abletoday.org to ask how we can provide an ABLE presentation to your legal staff, bar association, client group, or others. Additional resources that may be beneficial to you include, we have a full ABLE presentation in American Sign Language, ASL, with closed captions and voiceover in both English and Spanish on our website. In February 2023, we hosted a national webinar in collaboration with the Social Security Administration, which provides details on the benefits of owning an ABLE account, the relationship between ABLE accounts and Social Security disability benefits, and reviewing the ABLE-related information that must be provided to the Social Security Administration. Our website also lists various video testimonies from ABLE enrollees and ABLE programs, which can offer person-first perspectives on the positive impacts of ABLE accounts. The mission of ABLE today is to advance financial empowerment for people with disabilities by increasing the awareness of ABLE accounts. We do so through supporting nationwide outreach for ABLE programs and providing resources on ABLE accounts, such as this ABLE CLE course. Myself and my co-presenter, Juliana Chris, 
are both members able today. Special thanks to the Aspen members and CLE co-presenters, Elisa Ferguson from Able Now and Virginia 529, Chuck Saya from the NH Able Plan and the New Hampshire Governor's Commission on Disability, and John Stevens from the PA Able Savings Program and the Pennsylvania State Treasury. We would also like to thank Sean Snyder with the National Association of State Treasurers for his support of the Able CLE. We would like to thank several individuals who served as our ABLE CLE Advisory Committee, including Blaine Brockman from Darby Legal Assistance, Brian Clark with the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services, Mary McDermott with Special Abilities Network, and John Williams also with the New Hampshire Department of Health and Human Services. We would like to thank the DC Bar in Washington, DC for the use of their production studio. Through their hosting platform, we have the ability to provide this free CLE throughout the country. We'd also like to thank Brian Miller with Miller's Vision for our graphic design. For additional questions on ABLE accounts, please reach out to us via team at abletoday.org or for more information, visit our website at abletoday.org. To obtain CLE credit after the class ends, please do the following. For my events, click on the class title to expand the options. Click on the Get Certificate button to reveal a new window with your certificate checklist. Enter the participation code or codes from the class and click Submit. Complete the course evaluation where you'll be asked to enter your jurisdictional information and click Submit. You will see green check marks next to each category. Then click Get Certificate to access the appropriate certificate or certificates of attendance. If you encounter any issues, please email cle at dcbar.org and the DC Bar will be glad to assist. Thank you.